Hey everyone, I'm Harvest Build Destroy, and in this video I'm finally going to talk about Age of Empires 2 Definitive Edition. Is it truly the Definitive Edition of Age of Empires 2? For the most part, I would say yes, but what I personally wanted out of DE was pretty simple. I wanted matchmaking with no lag or disconnect issues. A fresh coat of paint and a couple of interface improvements would have been nice, but not essential, at least for me. HD Edition delivered none of these, and although I did used to play on Voobly a decade or so ago, I was never able to get Wololo Kingdoms running on my old computer, so up until now I haven't really been able to play the game in anything resembling the optimal way. So I'm personally pretty happy with DE, and it's mostly exceeded my expectations, particularly since my impression in the late stages of the beta was that it didn't seem like it was all that close to ready to release. Sure, the matchmaking system is far from perfect, and there are certainly some undesirable technical issues, but broadly speaking, I think almost regardless of what type of player you are, DE is the version of the game that you should be playing right now. That is, as long as your PC can run it well, and this is a pretty significant caveat. For a remastered version of a 1999 game, the minimum requirements are pretty high. To make matters worse, if you want to play ranked matchmaking games, you have to pass a stress test. Basically, it loads up an 8-player AI game with hundreds of units and buildings on screen to see how your PC handles it and then gives you a score. If you fail, you can't use matchmaking until you change your settings, do the test again, and pass. I bought a new computer a couple of months ago, and although I did pass the stress test, it wasn't by as much of a margin as I would have thought. If for whatever reason you haven't bought the game yet and you have an older machine, you might want to look at the requirements first if matchmaking is important to you. It's probably worth mentioning here that if you want to see the game in all its glory, you have to go to the Steam Workshop and download the enhanced graphics pack. It's not entirely intuitive to do so either, as the game doesn't seem to give you any hint beyond the initially grayed out enhanced graphics option under the graphics menu, but at least to my eyes, the enhanced graphics look nice. I'm already used to them and don't miss the legacy look. Sure, there's the odd unit that looks quite a bit different from its original model, but for the most part I think they've straddled the line between modernizing the graphics and retaining the original style quite well. Personally, what I do, and what I would recommend that you do for the best balance of visuals and performance, is to use the enhanced graphics, but to turn everything else off or to its lowest setting aside from blood. But depending on how up-to-date your PC is, you might have to turn off the enhanced graphics to pass the stress test. Unfortunately, this isn't the only technical issue either. Some people have been complaining about multiplayer disconnect since the game came out, but I personally never had it happen until the December patch. It's never happened to me specifically, but both of the guys I normally play with have disconnected a handful of times when we've played 2v2s and particularly 3v3s. It seems to happen maybe 5 or 10% of the time, which is at any rate a massive improvement over HD edition, at least in my experience. This is just a theory, but almost 100% of the time when someone disconnects from a game that I'm in, there is a player in the game with an Xbox Live icon by their name. This means that that player is playing the game through the Windows Store instead of using Steam. Let me know in the comments if you've also noticed a greater prevalence of disconnects in games with Xbox Live players. So far I've noticed a pretty strong correlation, but I also don't recall experiencing a single disconnect before the December patch, regardless of who was in the game. As I'm recording the audio for this video, a new patch has just come out, so hopefully these sorts of disconnect issues are soon to be a thing of the past. On a more positive note, DE doesn't seem to suffer from the same input delay issues as HD did. In HD, whenever you would right-click to tell a unit to move, it would take half a second or a second before the unit would actually do it, which made some of the more meticulous micro-moves all but impossible in practice. Good luck using formations to split crossbows against mangonels or dodging spears with scouts, and quick-walling was generally off the menu. HD's input delay led me and my friends to mostly play Nomad, where you don't have a scout and drushes and men-at-arms rushes are much less common. But DE is on par with any other newer game in this regard. You right-click, and your units move. When you're not dealing with disconnects, however, the game seems to run pretty smoothly. Sure, you get the occasional lag spike like you would in any other game, but nothing out of the ordinary. I'm a big fan of the improvements they've made to the interface, too. Age of Empires 2 finally has a properly functioning waypoint system. If you haven't played previous versions of the game recently, the waypoint system used to be wonky to say the least. When you would shift right click to add waypoints, a series of flags would appear, but the unit wouldn't actually follow them until you issued a final right click without holding down the shift key, after which the unit would follow the flags and then go to the final location you right clicked. In any other RTS game, this is how you cancel a series of waypoints, not set them in motion. You can still toggle between this waypoint system and the old one in the menus if you really want, but unless you're having trouble overwriting decades of muscle memory, why would you? The newfound ability to assign hotkeys to upgrades and simultaneously queue up both units and upgrades at the same production building are both awesome changes too. It's also great to be able to see your gatherers per resource without having to switch minimap modes, although I wish fishing ships and trade units would be considered part of your villager count, or that they'd add extra tabs to show your fishing ship and trade unit counts. To be fair, most of these changes were kind of expected, but it is nonetheless quite nice to finally be able to play the game with all the modern interface amenities. The game is still plenty difficult, it's just a bit less obtuse now. On that note, I'm also less opposed to the farm auto reseed button than I thought I'd be. 
As you might have noticed by now, I'm always a little wary of interface and AI improvements in RTS games as someone who views mechanical difficulty as an important part of what makes them compelling. I prefer to take them on a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes I think they're good, and sometimes I think they're bad. I guess if I had to pin it down to a rule, I would say I don't like it when the interface or AI makes strategic choices for you, choices that should allow a stronger player to gain advantages over a weaker player. But I think I'll leave that topic for another video as well. Anyway, when the information about DE's interface improvements first came out, I was fairly sure that I'd view the farm auto reseed button in a similar way to how I always viewed the Age of Mythology auto queue, albeit on a much smaller scale, as the AOM auto queue was basically a deal breaker for me. I was initially a bit worried that the new farm button would simplify econ management a bit too much, and we'd have to petition for it to be disabled as an option in ranked matchmaking or something, but now that it's here, I'm actually more or less fine with it. It doesn't seem to be all that significant anyway until the super late game, where you may have 50 or more farms. I would have been fine with them not including it in the game, but I think the specific way they've made it work is the right way. And for the record, this is how I'd like to see them do farms in AoE 4. But if you don't already know what I'm talking about, in DE there's a new button at your mill in addition to the old farm queue system where you could pay up front to have farmers automatically rebuild farms when they ran out. The new button is a toggleable farm auto reseed function that you can activate or deactivate whenever you want. When it's toggled on and a farm runs out of food, if you have enough wood to rebuild the farm, that wood will automatically be deducted from your stockpile and the villager will rebuild the farm. However, if you don't have the wood, that farmer simply goes idle until you manually tell it to rebuild the farm again. The reseed queue won't wait until you have the wood and then rebuild the farm automatically. If you don't have the wood at the moment the farmer gets back to the dead farm, that's it. That villager is now idle. And I think this was the perfect way to make this work. It eases the burden of constantly replanting farms in the late game, which was the intention, but still leaves some room to punish players who don't manage their economies well. It also probably isn't always a good idea to use the reseed button early on in the game anyway when 60 wood is still fairly significant. Having 60 wood periodically disappear from your stockpile early on in the game without having explicitly decided for that to happen yourself might mean that the wood you need to quick wall at a crucial moment will vanish and units will get into your base for instance. This sort of thing would be even worse if the reseed button would allow villagers to rebuild the farms after going idle once you have the wood. In general, I imagine using the reseed button too early in the game could be a crutch that could enable you to develop bad early game econ management habits. The reseed button also seems to result in villagers replanting the wrong farm here and there, and over time, a villager or two around a TC or mill might go idle because another villager stole its farm. I kinda like this too, as it makes the reseed button a blunt instrument. It drastically reduces the amount of babysitting your farmers require, but there's still a bit of room to reward the more meticulous player. There's also a fish trap auto reseed button, which so far in my experience doesn't seem to require any babysitting at all. This actually seems like a fairly significant change, as fishing now seems like a sustainable long-term source of food income. I imagine that small ponds on land maps are now worth docking in the mid to late game as a way to preserve real estate and increase your food income while only spending wood. As for what you get, game mode and feature-wise, when you buy the game, I would say it's about on par with what you should expect out of a remastered older game. All the previous versions of the game's campaigns have not only been included, but apparently updated, although I haven't replayed any of them yet myself. There are also three new campaigns. I've tried a handful of missions from the Koteon Khan campaign myself, and they seem well done enough. They retain the style and flavor of the classic campaigns, so if you want more of that, you'll find it. More interestingly to me, they've included a new series of five single-player Art of War challenge missions geared toward preparing casual single-player types for online multiplayer. The missions begin with a tutorial video narrated by the caster Barbecue Turkman, and each teaches a basic skill that's necessary for online play. Afterward, you're given a gold, silver, or bronze medal based on your performance. I've always felt that RTS games needed something like this, and although there was certainly room for more challenge missions, it's great to see they've included what they have. If you've never played online multiplayer before, and you can manage to get silver medals in all five, your first multiplayer experiences should go quite a bit more smoothly than they otherwise would have. They've also apparently updated the functionality of triggers in the scenario editor. I'm not really a map maker, so I don't really know the specifics, but custom scenarios have breathed quite a bit of life into the game over the years, so the more options map makers have at their disposal, the better. There's also a new game mode called Empire Wars, which is basically a random map game where you start with a decent sized feudal age base. But I personally just don't see anyone actually playing this game mode outside of maybe the odd casual single player person. Kinda like Turbo Random Map, which no one really seems to play, Empire Wars just seems to be for people who find the Dark Age build up period to be tedious, and I doubt many of those players will stick around for the long haul anyway, no matter how you streamline the random map experience. If anything, I can imagine this game mode being best suited to 8 player free for alls. Lastly, before I dive into the multiplayer stuff, DE has built in mod support, which is great, although I have encountered a few mods that didn't work. Nonetheless, it's now easy to search for, download, and activate whatever mod you could possibly want. Well, almost whatever mod you want. I'm now going to take this opportunity to make a mod request in case any mod makers happen to be watching. 
I'd like someone to make a mod that changes the functionality of the control and shift keys so that they function the way they do in Blizzard RTS games. In StarCraft and Warcraft, holding shift and clicking on units allows you to add or remove from selection just like in AoE, but control clicking a unit will select all units of that type on the screen, the same as double clicking. They also stack, so if you hold down both control and shift, you can add or remove all units of one type from your selection. They also both work the same way when you click on the portraits at the bottom of the screen. In AoE, on the other hand, both Control and Shift add or remove from selection, and there's no alternative to double-clicking to select all units of one type. I really don't see the need for two adjacent keys that do the same thing, and double-clicking units in the thick of things is a bit of a pain in the ass compared to Control-clicking. Once you have the option of doing either one, you might find you never double-click anything again. I know I did when I first got into Blizzard games, and it would be great if players had the option to use either system in DE. Alright, without any further ado, the multiplayer stuff. Age of Empires 2 finally has functioning matchmaking. The matchmaking system is far from perfect, but as far as I'm concerned, any matchmaking system is better than the lobby systems found in HD or on Voobly. You can still host unranked lobbies if you want in DE, but personally, unless the map pool gets really bad, I have no intention of ever doing so. Goodbye forever, lobbies. The lobby browser system seems a bit glitchy, too. Maybe it's just me, but I usually have to spam click refresh for a few seconds before it even shows any games. There's also a Spectate Games tab now, but as it currently works, it seems to be of limited usefulness. There's a search bar, but there's no way to filter the games available to Spectate by MMR or anything like that. This is a problem in general. There's no way to see anyone else's stats or profile in-game without having to use a third-party site. The only players whose stats you can see are the players on the leaderboard, and you can't click into their profiles or anything. All you can see is their name, icon, rank, rating, wins, and win percent. You can't even see your party members' ratings when you're queued up for matchmaking. I could imagine this causing problems in unranked lobbies if players just sort of have to self-assign a skill level using the honor system like most of us used to do back in the MSN Gaming Zone days because hardly anyone played rated back then. Also, I find it a bit strange that when you click the invite to party button, it always defaults to recently played rather than whichever tab you last had open. If anything, it should default to your Steam friends list. I've also found the spectator mode itself as well as the replay viewer to leave something to be desired. You still can't rewind, and I think they could make better use of the space on the screen to display the most useful information, although I don't have any concrete ideas as to how just yet. But I imagine someone will create a mod with a better spectator system sooner or later anyway if it hasn't already happened. Lastly, I think you should be able to opt out of being spectated if you don't want to be. Oh, and the buttons on the stats screen after the game are a bit confusing. One says return to map, and the other says return to main menu. It's easy enough to mistake them, and I wish they'd change them to say exit game and return to map or something like that. Anyway, let's move on to the matchmaking system. As I said before, it's not perfect, but it's not completely awful, and it seems like Microsoft is planning to tweak and improve it moving forward, although it was disappointing to see that there were no changes in the January patch. In the December patch, they updated the map pool, removing the maps that players were complaining about, particularly Highland and Rivers, and adding maps that players were requesting, such as Nomad, Arena, and Black Forest. They also gave us the ability to veto maps. You get 3 for 1v1, 1 for 2v2 and 3v3, and 0 for 4v4. I think getting the matchmaking right will always be an almost impossible task. While I would like to see more options, there's always the problem of queue times. The more different things you can queue for, the longer it's likely to take to actually find someone. So far, it seems to take 2 or 3 minutes to find a 1v1 and something like 5 to 8 minutes to find a team game. These are pretty long queue times, particularly compared to StarCraft 2 or WarCraft 3, but ultimately, they're still usually a lot faster than hosting lobbies. Plus, you don't have to talk to anyone or deal with people whining about whether or not to pick civs or teams in a team game. If I was positive that queue times wouldn't be affected, I would say there should ideally be separate queues and possibly even ladders for some of the more popular maps like Arabia, Arena, and Black Forest. But that's a big if. At the end of the day, consistently finding games hassle-free is what matchmaking is for, so if a bit of a wonky map pool is the price of that, so be it, I guess. But I do think we should get more vetoes. I would like to see them adopt the Warcraft 3 system. In Warcraft 3, there are 11 maps in 1v1, and each player gets 5 vetoes. A map is randomly selected from the maps that neither player has vetoed, so even if both players veto entirely different maps, the remaining map is still left to be selected. The current DE map pool contains 8 maps, Arabia, Black Forest, Arena, Nomad, Steppe, Team Islands, Gold Rush, and Mega Random. But like I said, in 1v1, you only get 3 vetoes. What makes this system a bit wonky is that these maps are pretty all over the place. Most of these maps are pretty distinct experiences, and given how long individual AoE games are, I don't think the matchmaking system should be able to force you to play a map you don't really want to play. I should note that I say this as someone who really enjoys the map diversity, especially for team games, but there have always been lots of players that only play a certain map type, or that strongly dislike water maps, defensive maps, etc. 
If you want to play more standard, mostly land maps, you don't have enough vetoes to do that in the current system, even in 1v1. It's of course impossible to please everyone, but considering the fact that the vast majority of AoE2 games have always been played on Arabia, it stands to reason that this is the group that should probably be accommodated. I'd like to see them increase both the number of maps in the pool and the number of vetoes, ideally such that it's possible to only play quote-unquote standard maps if you want to. I'd like to see more maps in the pool like Ghost Lake, Oasis, Mongolia, Sea Notes, and Scandinavia. The decision to have the same map pool for 1v1 in team games also seems questionable to me. In 1v1, I personally veto Nomad, Black Forest, and Team Islands, all of which are maps I think should only be in the team game map pool. Arena and Gold Rush, on the other hand, are maps I would really only ever want to play 1v1s on, and since you only get one veto for 2v2s and 3v3s, you can't veto both. When I play with my friends, I usually veto Gold Rush, which I've always found to be a gimmicky map that rarely leads to interesting team games, but is suitable enough for 1v1s where it's harder to completely lock down the center of the map. Generally speaking, I think it makes more sense to have a larger number of wonkier maps in the team game map pool, since team games are already quite a bit more chaotic. I might be in the minority here, but I love Mega Random, and despite vetoing Nomad for 1v1s, I'm always happy to see it on the load screen for a team game. Although as others have pointed out, the version of Nomad they're using on the ladder seems to be a bit low on gold. I wouldn't mind seeing maps like Land Nomad, Yucatan, Hideout, Budapest, or even Fortress Regicide in the team game map pool, whereas I could probably do without them in the 1v1 pool. Basically, leave the tryhard stuff for 1v1 and let a little more chaos into the team game pool. I think you could also make a case for having a separate 2v2 map pool somewhere in the middle. However the pools end up, I'd like to see them contain an odd number of maps with n number of vetoes where the total number of maps is equal to 2n plus 1. 9 maps with 4 vetoes, 11 maps with 5 vetoes, 13 maps with 6 vetoes, etc. For team games, these numbers would be the total for an entire team, even if you're queuing as a partial stack. For instance, if it was an 11 map pool with 5 vetoes and you were solo queuing for a 4v4, you'd only get 1 veto, a 2 stack would get 2, a 3 stack would get 3, and a full 4 stack would get all 5. Depending on the size of both the map pool and your queuing stack, you'd have to round the number of vetoes down to make it work out properly. I know essentially nothing about programming a video game, but in theory this shouldn't affect queue times, just which map you get when you find a match. I've also heard Viper mention the idea of having matchmaking select three maps and giving each player or team a veto. I think there would be both advantages and disadvantages to this kind of system. If they added this to the current system without changing anything else, I would probably view it as a mostly positive change. I like the idea in the sense that it would give you a bit more agency over which map you're playing, but it could also lead to an increase in salt from players or teams who don't get what they want. This would probably be affected by the specifics of how it was implemented, though. Would you be able to see your opponent's veto, and would you have to lock in your sieve before knowing which map was chosen? Ideally, the veto would be blind, and you wouldn't have to lock in your sieve until the map was finalized. If there was the possibility of locking into a clearly map-specific sieve and then finding out the map in question was vetoed, I could imagine a lot of players getting salty and maybe leaving the game right away. And yet, with the current free pick system, you end up with a very high percentage of meta sieves, which can get a bit stale even now when the meta is a bit more in flux due to all the new stuff. And on that note, Viper has also suggested the idea of having the matchmaking select a pool of, say, 10 or so sieves for you to choose from. While I would personally probably enjoy that kind of system, a lot of other players probably wouldn't. In theory, I would like Microsoft to just give us more options for what to search for, such that we can find the type of game we want as easily as possible, but the long queue times make this tricky. There are all sorts of interesting tweaks that could hypothetically be made to the matchmaking system, but they would all hinge on there being enough players searching for different types of games for them to work. I'd love the option to play a captain's mode with a sieve picking and banning stage, or the ability to play with all random sieves or mirror random sieves on both sides in a team game, but would options like these spread the people searching too thin and make it too difficult to find a game in a reasonable amount of time? I don't really have an answer to that. What Microsoft could try is maybe running week-long matchmaking system experiments once a month or something like that. Try some of these things concurrently with the normal matchmaking system and see what people like. This way we could see what works best and how this sort of thing might affect queue times. This sort of thing could also add a lot of variety to the game in the long term. There are a couple of other more minor tweaks that I'd like to see too that wouldn't affect queue times. In the context of the current map and veto system, an option to make it impossible to get the same map twice in a row would be nice. Sometimes my friends and I don't want to play Black Forest three times in a row, and sometimes that does happen. It might also be nice to be able to pick which players will be pocket and flank in 3v3 and 4v4, although I guess that could exacerbate the issue of too many metasivs being picked. Like I said before, getting the matchmaking right is a difficult task, and it's naturally going to take some time, particularly since AoE2 players have been accustomed to using a lobby system for two decades. Anyway, that's about all for this video. I'm pretty happy with DE, but then again, I also have a brand new PC. If your computer is relatively up to date and your expectations of a remastered 1999 game are reasonable, you'll probably find yourself mostly pleased with it. 
It certainly had a smoother launch than AoE 1 Definitive Edition, and here's to hoping that most of us will still be playing it five years from now. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.